All right, thank you. And I'm going to I'm going to try not to be too loud. So if I start getting loud, then somebody let me know. Um, so first of all, uh, just so I've got an idea of who I'm talking to, how many of you all are uh, beef producers, small ruminants, and what about mixed equine, small ruminant beef, a little bit of everything? Okay. Uh, what about uh, extension NRCS soil conservation? Great. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to give you kind of a view from 10,000 feet of some power fencing essentials and some of the technology that goes behind it and also some of the structure itself that we'll get a lot deeper to in the field. So the first thing with power fence that we have to understand is that it is a psychological barrier. In other words, let's take a four strand, multi strand, high tensile fence, for example. If it is not electrified with power, then it's not much of a psychological, it's not much of a psychological barrier or a physical barrier. Now what Peyton talked to you about with the fixed knot woven wire, definitely a physical barrier. So with Electrified high tensile permanent fence, we have to remember psychological barrier. And in a lot of cases, we know that that psychological barrier can be very, very effective. As a matter of fact, in just about every zoo that we can drive to within a day's drive of right here in Madison County, protecting all of these animals, or actually protecting the folks at the zoo that are visiting these animals, we can find electrified power fencing. Now, in those projects, we designed those as weeds and grass and vines and things like that, uh, where you can't see it from outside the exhibit. But the fact is that if we can control these animals effectively with power fence, and a lot of times this is the primary barrier, there, there will be power fence between this animal and the actual physical barrier, which could be the the moats or the cable fences or the, the wrought iron fences uh, to keep those animals in. So we're using power fence for primary barrier on these critters. So should there be any reason we could not use power fence to control these critters? Not if we plan it correctly, build the right structure behind it. So all of the things that go into consideration for permanent fencing, which would be bracing and post energizer installation, so there's no reason why we can't control these animals. And in this photo, uh, that just happens to be a herd of cattle grazing behind a single strand. Now this is temporary fence, but it's fed from a permanent fence system, but that's, they're grazing behind a single strand of electrified poly wire. And just so happens that they're doing this at the end of December, 1st of January, and stockpile fescue about knee deep while the neighbors are feeding hay. This is made possible by power fencing. Uh, and we'll get a lot deeper into this um, at the Kentucky Grazing School. So uh, Dr. Torch mentioned there's one coming up in Princeton uh, later this month, and there should be one in Versailles later in the fall. Uh, so that's on the temporary side. So we can control livestock with power fencing. We have to remember that power fencing is a system, and with any type of system, any type of system, it's going to have multiple parts. And for that system to work, those parts have to work together all the time in unison without taking shortcuts. Now, I guarantee you that the Louisville Zoo does not use things like cut up pieces of water hose on the gorilla exhibit for their power fencing. Some of you laugh, I, your neighbors probably do that, right? Um, so don't make fun of your neighbors for, for doing things like using old cut up pieces of water hose or oil jugs nailed to a tree for an insulator. Um, we should not do those type of shortcuts and expect the fence to work around the clock for us. So with any system, there's components. With power fencing, you're going to have the energizer, the fencer, the hot box, whatever you want to call it, you're going to have the power source. You're also going to have the grounding system, which is the most overlooked part of the fence system globally. Uh, that's the first place that, that we go to with troubleshooting electric fence with the company I work for. We're a global company. And it doesn't matter if it's here in New Zealand or in Europe, the ground system is the first place we start to troubleshoot. And it just so happens the ground system is the cheapest part of the system to improve on. Now, those of you all that are livestock producers, you probably agree with me, and I'm a livestock producer myself. We like cheap, don't we? And there are some places we can do cheap, and that is the ground system. 
cheapest place to improve. We'll talk more about that later. And also the, the final part of the system is the insulated fence system, which is your insulators, your post, your underground cable, um, all of your connectors, joint clamps, cutout switches. So all of those parts of the system have to be designed properly and installed properly to work. And then we don't want to forget about the lead out, which that is the simple little wire that goes from the energizer to the fence. And we can do every other part of the system right per spec and use a rusty piece of 17 gauge wire to transfer that power from the energizer to the fence and everything gets choked down there. So don't forget the lead out. Um, just a side note, if you're going to use any type of poly products, use a low impedance energizer. Uh, most every company now makes a low impedance energizer. They're, it's pretty hard to, to find one that is not, uh, but there are still some available that would be called solid state. Solid state has a tendency to melt poly wire if grass touches it, just because the power stays on the wire a little bit longer um, than it needs to. So low impedance technology has been around for 25 years or so. The power only stays on the wire about three one thousandths of a second. So it's pulsing every second, but the power is actually on the wire about three one thousandths of a second, which is not long enough to heat up the grass that's touching the wire, which is not going to start grass fires, and it's also not going to melt your poly wire. So the big question, what size, how do I compare, how do I know what to choose? So let's look at some of these different ratings you'll see on packaging. You've got mileage, acreage, um, multi-strand, single-strand, jewels. You've got ratings from companies that are marketing several countries around the world. You come to the U.S., the same Energizer is going to have one rating versus you go to New Zealand and it's going to have a different rating. Same Energizer, but magically the, the ratings change on it. So what in the world do we use to compare and choose? So let's look at mileage, for example. Mileage seems to be a pretty common denominator um, across the industry of an estimated power. So Step with me for a moment outside of Kentucky, across the Mississippi River, where everything is laid out in big, nice squares of land. So a section of land, if we go out in Missouri and find a, some good flat country, we'll find a section of land that is 640 acres square. Now on that section of land, if I drive around it, I'm going to have four miles when I get back to the beginning because it's one mile, one mile, one mile, one mile. It's four, it's four miles around 640 acres. So I should be able to go to the farm store and buy one of those $75 energizers that says it'll do five miles, one of them good ones, and take it to Missouri and put it on 640 acres and it performed properly, right? That's what the marketing says on the label. Five mile energizer, it ought to do four miles easy. Well, that's 640 acres in Missouri. It's probably more than that in Kentucky with our fields that are like this uh, to go around 640 acres. So let's take one step further. What about those good 100 mile fence boxes? Boy, they'll just burn their hooves off, won't they? So I should be able to take that two or $300 100 mile fence charger, go out to New Mexico and put it around 400,000 square acres because if I've got a 400,000 square acre ranch in New Mexico, and I drive around it, it's going to be 25 miles on this side, 25, 20, it's going to be 100 miles when I get back to the beginning. Is that realistic? Probably not, but use your own judgment. Uh, but if we take the math, if we take the packaging verbatim, and all companies do this, even the company I work for, we have this thing called a marketing department. And marketing departments, they, they do a lot of creative things. And there's other words you can use for creative, but you get where I'm going. Um, so... What we can do, though, is we can compare those mileage ratings within brands because there is no magic formula to say X number of miles and plug this energizer in a wall in the, the plug-in and it spit out a formula and say, okay, this is a five-mile energizer, this is a three-mile. It's all estimates, and you know what estimates are. So we can compare within brands, and it's probably safe to say that a 100-mile rated energizer is probably four times stronger than a 25-mile rated energizer, but we can't compare brand A to B to C because nobody uses the same estimate, and quite frankly, they're probably not real accurate if we look at it in actual terms of a snapshot from viewing down on what four miles or 100 miles looks like. So we do have this thing called jewels. Most every company will give some type of a jewel rating, Jewel ratings are something that are fairly consistent as long as you're looking at stored jewels or looking at output jewels. 
Uh, stored joules always stay consistent. They don't vary, but if you have a 20 joule energizer that's 20 stored joules, you'll never get 20 joules delivered to the fence because there's some inefficiencies involved. But the stored joules are all, or the output joules are always going up and down depending on the load. So pick one and compare across brands if you want to. But we can be held accountable as companies on our joule rating. We can't exactly fudge the numbers on joules. So now that we have that, <clears throat> then there must be a way that we can say, okay, X number of joules will do X number of miles. Right? You see where I'm going with this? How many joules per mile? So let's look at some different options. Well, first, let's look at what some of the companies say. Uh, some of the companies, um, around 0.2 joules per mile, 0.1 joule per mile, uh, it automatically just doubles once we bring it from New Zealand to the U.S. magically. I don't know what happens magically when it comes across the ocean, but uh, the same energizer automatically does twice as many miles of fence when it gets here. Um, and then look at diff some different brands. They're about 0.2 joules per mile. But, okay, we know companies will stretch the truth to us, right? Because they have marketing departments, and marketing departments want to stretch the truth, naturally. So let's say FUI on the companies. Let's see what NRCS, an extension, says. So NRCS in Tennessee, uh, got a fairly long track record of some decent research and specs. They say, nah, the companies are a little bit too ambitious. Let's, let's go about one joule per mile. A Missouri extension just happens to agree with NRCS in Tennessee. About one joule per mile is a good estimate. Uh, and Missouri Extension has done a lot of work with power fencing. They wrote, literally almost wrote the book on uh, power fencing for serious grazers back in the, the early 2000s, which is a, a good publication. There may be a variation of that in your, in your handouts, too, I think. Um, but then you go to maybe California and Minnesota Extension. Well, they, they're totally opposite of what Tennessee and Missouri is. So the answer is nobody can agree because there is no magic formula. And the real answer is, it depends. The number of joules per mile, the number of joules per acre, it depends. Now, nobody was expecting that answer. Um, but it depends on the number of strands, how those strands are joined together, how much weeds and grass and honeysuckles and multiple roses are grown up in that fence, how much rusty wire you have joining your energizer to the to the fence and jumping around corners if you're using double insulated cable going underground or if it's single insulated cable buried um, just straight to the soil without any pipe in it. All of those things add up and they matter on how many joules per mile you may be. So the answer is there is no answer. However, what we do know is when you are buying joules, you're buying horsepower. Just, in a, just like a tractor, it doesn't matter what brand of tractor, it doesn't matter what brand of energizer, when you buy an energizer, you are paying for joules you're paying for horsepower. And just like with equipment, the more horsepower we have, the more load we can carry. Now, voltage is like RPMs. If I don't have enough horsepower and I put too big of a load behind the tractor, the RPMs drop down, the tractor coughs a few times and puffs out black smoke and it dies. The same way with electric fencing. If I don't have enough joules and I load the fence down with weeds, grass, bad connections, Connections, shorts, animals. Animals touching the fence are actually a, a, a quick, small short. If I don't have enough joules, enough horsepower, my voltage drops, my RPMs drop, my voltage drops, and I cannot shock through the, the short and shock the animal. So you get what you pay for. Um, typically, from a general standpoint, most serious uh, grazers that are using or most serious producers that are using electric fence once you get into that five, six, eight joule range, that's that's kind of the baseline of uh, where you would start with a permanent fence system. And of course, you can go way up to a hundred joules or more. But if you're if you're not in that four, five, six, eight joule range, then you're really not serious about it. And you can get into that range somewhere in for a couple hundred dollars. So power supply options. When it comes to the cost side of it, it's one a good thing to keep in mind that. 110 volt plug in the wall energizers are always going to be the cheapest source of power because what are we paying for? Joules. The cheapest source of a joule is through 110 volt power. Now you can also get solar and you can get battery. With battery energizers, we're going to have to have two batteries most of the time so we can swap them out while one's charging. Uh, with solar, 
then it's good to keep in mind that solar is going to cost about four to six times as much for the same power. So to get the same amount of horsepower, the same amount of joules from solar, I'm going to spend four to six times the money. There are instances where solar is necessary. If it is necessary, keep in mind you are going to pay more to get the same joule rating as you would with the 110 volt. And also a lot of solars will come with a self-contained gel cell battery. Those are great, typically for small areas of fence, um, generally somewhere with 50 acres or less uh, on the self-contained gel cell batteries. If you're going to do a large amount of permanent fence, then consider a solar energizer that has a deep cycle marine battery and then a solar panel that charges the deep cycle marine battery that then plugs into the energizer. So the self-contained gel cells are great for small areas or for temporary fencing. Don't try to overestimate uh, their power on uh, permanent fence systems. And also, if you have a $200 budget, you are going to get a lot more power out of a $200 plug-in. So just that is a very important point. There's been a lot of people that's just had three fits and a mad spell because they spent $200 on the solar and it wouldn't do what their $200 plug-in that died three years ago used to do. So, so how a fence system works. And in this example, we have an all-hot system. Morgan touched on this briefly. So an all-hot system would be in this example, three strands of hot wire. So this three strand high tensile fence is powered by an energizer, which has a lead going to the fence and a lead out going to the ground rods, the ground system. So in this case, when the cow walks up, touches one of those electrified wires, the electricity, those electrons travel down through her body, down through her feet, back through the soil, back through the ground, to the ground system and then, then completes the circuit. Now there's some inefficiencies there because we're relying on the soil to conduct those electrons. But with this all hot system, if this is designed properly and we have the proper type of ground system, then this ground system acts like an antenna. And that's what we're wanting. We're wanting something to pick up that signal of that animal touching the wire. So all hot system, this is what I use and recommend most of the time in Kentucky and Tennessee and most of the southeast, um, but we have to rely on the soil. Now the second type is a hot ground system. In this example, we have three strands of high tensile wire. The top strand and bottom wire are electrified, and the center strand, the middle strand, is grounded. Now this is a true hot ground system. There are not many true hot ground systems in the southeast that I've seen in the last 17 years. Because for a true hot ground system, this non-electrified wire has to be connected all the way back to the ground system that is then connected directly to the energizer. That means every gateway, every corner, that ground wire has to be connected under the gate right along with the hot wire. Every time we get to a corner, the ground wire has to jump around the corner to make that complete circuit back to the original ground system that's tied to the energizer. There's a lot of fences built, especially in Kentucky, that are four, five, six strand fences, and only half of them will be electrified. The other half are called ground wires, but they're actually not because they're not connected back to the ground system that's connected to the energizer. We can't exactly get away with that in the western U.S. where we have high mineral low moisture soils, they have to build a true hot ground system because the soil conductivity is so low. Now in this case, when an animal goes up, touches the hot wire and the ground wire at the same time because everything's connected together, it's just like that cow walking up to the fence charger, putting her nose on the hot and her tongue on the ground and receiving the instant shock because it's all connected in the system. Um, this is a great system designed for small ruminants. Um, we have to be cautious, though, using a hot ground, because what happens here if a tree falls on this fence overnight? One of the reasons we use a lot of high tensile smooth wire is it is flexible and resilient, so if trees fall on it, it's easy to repair. If a tree falls on this hot ground system, I have a hot wire and a ground wire, a true ground wire mashed together. Now I have a dead short. If a tree falls on this system and mashes one, two, three wires together, even mashes them all the way to the soil, that two or three foot section where that tree's laying on top of the ground, mashing all those wires together is not going to typically neg negatively affect my fence system if I have enough horsepower pushing it from the energizer. So I can mash a couple of these wires together, no big deal, especially if it doesn't contact the ground. The tree limb has very, very high resistance. 
so it's not going to conduct a lot of electricity anyway. So be cautious with the hot ground system. If you're going to build this, actually build it right and connect this ground wire or wires all the way back to the, to the beginning of the system where your ground rods are uh, going to the energizer. So the recommendation, Morgan hit on this earlier, the recommendation that used across the industry and um, government organizations would be three ground rods, six foot deep, ten foot apart. That's the minimum. Also, it's recommended to use like materials. In other words, if we have galvanized ground rods, use galvanized wire. If you have a galvanized terminal on your energizer, use a galvanized wire to connect to the galvanized terminal. Never use copper and mix it with another metal, ever. If you take a copper ground rod, attach a galvanized wire to it, electrolysis can happen where you have moisture and electricity forcing through two dissimilar metals, so two different types of material. The copper will eat the galvanization off your galvanized wire and it will rust into or burn into. Now you can use a copper ground rod and a copper wire and then you chuck that up in your galvanized energizer terminal. Guess what happens to the galvanized energizer terminal? It burns off. It looks like you took a sawzall and just sawed it right into. I see it all the time in energizers that are waiting for repair at dealers. Nothing's wrong with the energizer, but the ground terminal just mysteriously burn off of it. That's because somebody put a copper wire on a galvanized terminal. Stainless steel is not much better. Uh, copper will eventually react with stainless. So keep copper out of the system unless everything is copper. The copper ground rod on this building serves a different purpose than our galvanized ground system on the electric fence. I can go find the ground rod that's connected to the power service in this building and cut it off. And the lights will still stay on. Because that is for safety. The ground rod on this building is for safety reasons. The ground system on our electric fence is for shocking the animal reasons. So it's necessary to shock the animal. Can't stress this enough. And galvanized ground rods are cheap. Um, it's the cheapest way to improve your electric fence system. So the bigger antenna you've got, the further you can reach out across the farm to shock that animal. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to reach out and shock the animal. A rusty piece of rebar, we didn't even talk about rusty rebar or T-post. There's a reason, because that's junk. Don't use a rusty piece of rebar for your ground rod. The ground rod gets hot when a cow touches the fence. The ground rod conducts electricity. Rust does not conduct electricity. A rusty piece of rebar is an accident waiting to happen. So stay away from rust, uh, materials that will rust, painted T-post, not, not good at all. So lead out, uh, it's very important to mention, we'll talk more about lead out in the field, very important to mention on lead out, if you um, have a 12 and a half gauge high tensile wire fence system, make sure you're using a 12 and a half gauge lead out wire or the cable that goes from the energizer to the fence. We don't want to start out with a small wire and dump it into a big wire. Larger wire carries more power for longer distances. So from a resistance standpoint, um, <clears throat> the, the standard that we'll use would be 12 and a half gauge high tensile and it has 56 ohms per mile. The larger the wire in terms of steel, the less resistance, the more conductive it is. So if we could take some 8-gauge wire, which there is no 8-gauge high tensile readily available, it would be 22 and a half ohms of resistance. We're wanting zero ohms. We want no resistance on that wire. We want the electrons to flow as freely as they can to get down the fence line and shock the cow or the neighbor's kid or a dog or coyote or whatever. So we want zero ohms. We'll never get there. So let's look at 56 ohms per mile, one strand of high tensile. Now let's go to the 16 gauge or the 17 gauge little skinny electric fence wire that comes on a short roll on the bottom shelf at the farm store. That stuff is a horrible conductor. It's at 160 ohms per mile, a lot less conductive than high tensile. So what we can do though is we can take a, our high tensile fence and actually increase the conductivity of it pretty easy on a multi-strand. And we do that by simply paralleling the wires, so joining the wires up and down at both ends of the fence. So if I have a four-strand fence and I go to one end, because I'm going to electrify all four strands, if I go to one end and I connect those four strands, one, two, three, four, now I have electrified all four strands. I have 56 ohms per mile of resistance because I've got 
one strand, two strand, three strand, four strands. I'm essentially electrifying four miles of fence at 56 ohms per mile on a mile long stretch. If I go to the other end of that fence, to the other brace assembly, whether it's 600 foot away or 2,500 foot away, and I join those wires up and down again, one, two, three, four. So I'm jumping them up and down at this end, and I'm going to go to that end and jump them up and down, one, two, three, four. Now I have went from 56 ohms per mile to 14 ohms per mile. Four times more conductivity simply by connecting those wires in parallel. So what this also means, if I have a four or an eight strand or six strand high tensile fence and only half of them are electrified and they're not, the other half aren't being used as true grounds, they're just there for a visual barrier or to hold the earth together. We just put them there and didn't electrify them because we saw somebody else do that and don't know why they did it. Um, if I were to electrify those, I can increase the conductivity of my fence. More wires carry more power for longer distances. More wires are easier to electrify than single wires. So connect your fence in parallel. We'll talk about that in the field. Um, protect your investment. Lighting diverters, surge protectors, those things are uh, something easy we can do, especially with a plug-in energizer. Use a surge protector of some sort. An adequate ground system. So the adequate ground system is also a good protection from lightning. If you're in a lightning prone area, the more ground rods you have, the better connections you have, the more lightning protection you have. If you're in a very high chance of lightning area, you can actually drive your ground rods in a circular fashion. It takes about 20 foot of dead space, but you can drive your ground rods in a circle, connect those together, connect them to a common center ground rod, then go to the energizer, and that's superior lightning protection because electricity hates to travel in circles. Uh, lightning does. So can, that can subvert some lightning damage too, but that's the extreme case. So low impedance technology, modern electric fencing can uh, can do a lot of good things. We can shock through weeds and grass. We cannot shock through thickets. So we can't perform miracles with low impedance technology. So it will take some mechanical control or some type of chemical control if you wish. Uh, but don't just let the electric fence line get growed up like this because it will not be very effective. Uh, speaking of effective, uh, there's some tools and things that are available that may not be the best idea. One thing are these little, these little 10 cent doodads here. Uh, the concept is you, you use this as an insulator, so if you've got a 2,000-foot a stretch of fence, you slide a couple hundred of these things over your wire all the way down to every post, and you take a staple and you drive it in. If you drive the staple in too tight, it cracks the Mickey Mouse plastic this is made of, and you have a short. If you don't drive your staple in tight enough, then the little thing slides out of the way, and it still shorts on the post. So not desirable. If you want to build the absolute cheapest fence possible that's probably going to have some issues in five to ten years, then please use these. If you're trying to build a 20-year fence, don't use these. Um, also, uh, good quality materials. Some insulators will shred and, and cut through pretty easy. Those are going to be ones that typically aren't backed by much of a warranty. Uh, stay away from those. Also, we want to stay away from rust in the system. And in this case, we've got some rusty 17-gauge wire that's being used as our gate handle connector loop. That's not a good idea. Uh, we want to conduct our electricity under the gateway, and if we do have an electrified gap, that gap should be unelectrified when it's unplugged. So don't use your gaps to transfer electricity. Don't use your gates, your electrified gates, to transfer electricity across a gateway on a permanent fence. Polywire, that's fine. If it's a permanent fence, permanent high tensile fence, go under your gateway with double insulated cable in some type of protective pipe. doesn't have to be conduit, but some type of protective pipe to keep that pressure and rocks and things from cutting into it. Uh, also, these rubber wraparound tube insulators, um, these are typically responsible for a lot of shorts on electric fence after that 10-year mark. They will crack and break and, and open up on the backside and inside and cause issues. Also, on the inside of this, it's a great place for bugs, and when bugs die, they put off bug juice, and bug juice is acidic and the acidic bug juice will rust the wire. It eats the galvanization off high tensile wire in that moist little tunnel. And then if you have an impact on the fence, your wire is rusted in that tube and it'll break and your fence falls to the ground. So we don't recommend these tubes. Um, they, for about 10 years, they were not, um, Kentucky-wise for specs and NRCS, these were not allowed because they didn't think they would use it for a 20-year fence. Uh, they've been put back in the specs, but they're still 
highly discouraged. Woo, I don't even want to, that's a mess. We won't even talk about that situation. There's, we could spend an hour talking about that. Also, um, look for good quality class three galvanized materials. Here's an example of some uh, galvanization that started to crack off early. Then we had some arcing on a strainer. Uh, Peyton covered class three galvanization. If you're using steel in your fence system, doesn't matter what component, make sure it's class three galvanized, especially with your underground cable um, that's jumping your, from your energizer to the fence where you're cutting that coating off to make your connections. If it's not class three galvanized, it'll eventually rust. And there's just some things that I don't even know what to say. This is the do not use everything example. So in this picture we have some PVC pipe, some zip ties, some water hose, a broken yellow insulator that's no longer in use. Um, should we expect that fence to work very well? I, the Louisville Zoo is not going to do this on the gorilla exhibit, I guarantee you that. It would make for some great news though. Um, when the gorillas got out. And of course, oh, forgot to mention the Texas corner insulator. Uh, don't use things like tires for insulators. Also, um, some things to consider are springs. If we're gonna use springs, make sure you're using a good class three galvanized spring. This is originally a tension indicator spring, so it has nothing to do. So this original design came here in the 80s with the non-electrified high tensile concept. Um, and it was to indicate tension. So the proper description of this is a tension indicator spring. This is not a tension spring. This is not a spring that's supposed to give you some kind of magical flex to the fence. The high tensile wire has that in it built in, free from the factory. High tensile has that flex. So this is to indicate tension. Um, if you're using these, then make sure you're class three galvanized. If not, if it rusts, it'll cause some issues. Also, uh, high density, we're using plastic insulators, make sure you're using a high density. Here's a low density that has shredded through. We'll show this example in the field. Um, and then offsets. So real quickly, I'll finish up um, with some examples of offsets. It's something that, I'll check my time here, make sure I'm not fixing to get run off. So am I good, Chris, for about five minutes, 10? Okay. Uh, electric offsets, there's the publication in your, in your handout. Uh, we're going to talk about that in the field. It'll probably be one of the last things we do, so I'm going to give you a little primer on this. We know this is a common problem with small ruminants, sheep and goats, and probably even alpacas. Do alpacas rub on fences? No, alpacas don't rub on fences. Okay. Uh, so sheep and goats will rub on fences and scratch. That can obviously compromise the integrity of the wire. Uh, here's also, we can see this happening. If you, if, Of course, these cows are probably hungry, but they just stick their head right under the woven wire and graze away. As a matter of fact, the barbed wire at the bottom didn't even really deter them any. That's strange. So we can stop that uh, with an offset fence. Um, and then also, well, here's so sometimes we put a barbed wire on top of a fence. We really don't know why we do it. We just do it because it's always been done that way. But this barbed wire that's up here at about 60 inches, how good of a job did it do at protecting this fence down here at rump level on the sheep or rump level on the cow? None. It did zero. So barbed wire on top, uh, typically we even see that it's not effective at even keeping animals from rubbing on it. But so some type of wire on top, um, and here's an example of the electrified high tensile on top that had a malfunction and now it's shorted out on top of the wire. So if you have giraffes or horses, then it would be recommended to put some type of wire on top. If you have cattle or small ruminants, where are they going to be pressuring the fence at? Rump level, nose level, put your offset wire at that 30 to 36 inch range. For small ruminants, go down to that 20, 24 inch range. That's where the pressure gets put on the fence. The pressure doesn't get put on the fence up here. How many times do you see a 1200 pound cow reaching up like this to graze on that side of the fence? She's gonna go down to the bottom and push her head under the woven wire and graze that grass. So some little things to think about, just because we've always seen a wire on top, does it really make sense to do that? I haven't found a, a good reason yet. Uh, so if somebody has a good reason, I'd love to include that uh, in my presentation. So put your offsets at rump level. Here's some examples. These are some drive-in steel type offsets. 
at 33 inches or so. It's protecting this old woven wire fence. Uh, it's also protecting, uh, in this case, the giraffes from rubbing and scratching on the barbed wire at the top that's really not doing anything, but um, it sells barbed wire, I guess. And so here's another example. This is some plastic offsets. Not really desirable because there's some down pressure on this fence and it's, it is required to be put at every post, uh, but still it's protecting that old woven wire behind it. Uh, an example that Morgan had mentioned is an offset that actually attaches to the wire fabric itself. And here's this example. We'll show these out in the field, but that's given me 12 inches of separation from my woven wire that's in the background. Uh, and it attaches directly to the wire. It doesn't matter what type of post or how many um, posts I have with these 12 inch. And there's about four different companies that make a variation of this. They're very easy to install. Great for rented land. If you're renting or leasing a farm, that has an existing woven wire fence that even may be older or an old barbed wire fence that needs some repair. You can put a single strand of high tensile on the inside of that, throw about six or 7,000 volts on it. It'll keep your livestock from pressuring that old fence. When you give up the lease on that farm, you take a five gallon bucket and a screwdriver, you take those offsets off, you spool your high tensile up and you've left the fence exactly like you found it. Uh, considerations for post on electric fencing. So, uh, we have several different varieties to choose from. Steel T-posts would be the least desirable for a couple of different reasons. Steel T-posts are not desirable because steel is a conductor and it's an accident waiting to happen. If we have an insulator that pops off, then we have a hot wire against a steel T-post. Even though rust and, and paint does not conduct well, we still have a short. Steel T-posts have no flexibility. That steel T-post is rigid. It's not going to flex any. The alternative to that would be um, a rigid four inch wooden post or four to five inch. Um, much better than steel because it's not going to lose as much electricity if we have an insulator failure, but there is no flexibility in that wooden post. So if a deer impacts the fence, if we're fencing along street streams or rivers with trees that are hanging over the edge of us, tree falls on the fence, there's no flex to that wood post. So something's going to give, sometimes it could be an insulator, sometimes it could be the wire. Um, alternatives to that would be a composite type post. There's several composite posts on the market that are made of glue and wood chips and some plastic and things like that that will have some flex. Fiberglass is probably the ultimate insulated type post. Fiberglass has some afflictions of itself though because fiberglass um, is, if it's not coated, it's hard to handle so it can shred and have these little fiberglass fibers that come off on your hands. You can get the coated post However, you still just have a round cylinder driven into the ground and those can pop up out of the ground if you go down in dips. But fiberglass is a great alternative to steel uh, and even to wood. And then also um, some hybrid type fiberglass posts. We'll show you one of those later that actually do have some retention. So we may not have to drive a post two foot in the ground to make it hold if it has some other things at the bottom to keep it in the ground. Uh, brace assemblies, Peyton hit on this. This is absolutely the most important part of a permanent electrified high tensile system. We'll talk about some different braces. Um, and here's some examples of some things that we'll probably mention like X braces. Do they make sense? They do not make sense at all from a physics and geometry standpoint. And Morgan can probably shed some light on that later. So X braces, uh, especially ones that aren't tied off to that are just there in the middle. Um, one of those wires is always going to be loose. Trying to fence in curves, don't build braces in curves or some alternatives to that. This is a photo, this is a, an illustration from one of the Stay Tough publications. And I think this is in one of their publications. If not, it's on their website. But this is a great example of how the brace system works. Is this in the publication, Eric, that you all handed out? Okay, this is a great example of exactly why we do what we're going to do in the field, because we're going to build a brace that may not look like every other brace you've seen driving up and down the road, but there is reason behind it, um, and there's some, definitely some physics and science behind it. Also, we're going to show you on electric fencing how to maybe prevent some foot traps that you see, or some areas where you could have your brace wire get into your electrified wire. We're going to uh, show you how to trim that up real nice and pull those wires together. Um, flowing through curves. We don't have that example today, but you can build high tensile fencing, and, and this would this would be true for uh, the, the high tensile fixed knot fencing as well. So high tensile smooth wire, high tensile fixed knot. You can flow through curves. 
And in this case, we're flowing around this curve. We don't have to build a brace here and a brace here and a brace here. As a matter of fact, you can go up to 20 degrees in a curve, and that is part of your NRCS specs in Kentucky now. You can flow 20 degrees through a curve without building braces, and there's some pretty easy math to figure that. Uh, so I can turn a 90 degree turn and never build a brace, as long as I'm only turning 20 degrees off of a post. And that's really easy to do. You go right here, eight foot in line, step over three, there's your 20 degrees. Line up, go eight foot, step over three, there's your 20 degrees. You can just fence in circles and never build a brace if you want to. Because braces is where you have to stop and spend more money. So bracing is probably the most expensive component of the fence system. So we want to have as few braces as possible. Uh, we'll talk about post spacing real quick on the high tense electrified smooth. Um, our recommendation is from 30 to 50 feet. That should be your target between posts. Typically in Kentucky, Tennessee, Ohio area, we're more at that 30 feet between post recommendation. Anything closer than that, you lose your flexibility and flexibility is the key. Uh, consider your, material, your materials, how much retention you have in the ground, how much flexibility you have, um, and also make sure you're following your manufacturer's recommendations on a uh, specific type of post spacing. So again, we are looking for that 30 to 50 foot spacing. This also uh, significantly changes the cost structure of the fence. Water gaps and stream crossings, this is something we get a lot of questions about. We sometimes don't have time to cover, but if you are crossing streams, especially if you fenced off both sides of a stream and you're going to have a crossing where you're, you're crossing with equipment or letting cattle get from one field to the other, then there's some easy ways to do stream crossings using power fence without putting hanging a bunch of pallets and cattle panels from it. You would simply run an electrified strand across the stream and you can hang chains or even better than chains would be uh, pieces of half inch conduit that are electrified. It's going to keep cattle from walking through. And those pipe that they're hanging there when the, when the stream gets up and floods, those pipe are not going to get tangled and they're just going to kind of flow with the water and debris. Um, but this is a very, very easy system. Uh, we've designed several of these with some NRCS projects across the eastern U.S. Uh, much better than hanging uh, a bunch of tin and pallets from a cable. So, any questions? We'll get real deep into some of these discussions in the field, I'm sure. Any questions?